You remember this from yesterday, don't you? New start. Even the way to health is found in the sanctuary. So let's run through it quickly. Number one, what do we have? Temperance at the cross. Self must die that Christ may live. Learning how to control yourself. So when you're sharing with me, hey, listen, you know, the sanctuary holds the the blueprint for better health. So that's what we can learn from the altar of sacrifice. What can we learn from the labor? Water refreshes the soul. (laughs) We can learn from the table of showbread that we must have right nutrition. What can we learn from the altar of, uh, from the seven branch candlestick? Remember, fire gives off light. Heat and needs oxygen to burn. Just as God's people need sunlight and you need to raise that heat in your body when you exercise in fresh air. The altar of incense, trust in God. And what's the last one? Rest. (laughs) Rest. There's a commandment right in there that tells you about rest. And this is one of my favorites. If you don't see it in the Bible, then check it out in the stars. That's the Orion constellation. Check out what Ellen White says about this. She says, dark, heavy clouds came up and clashed against each other. The atmosphere parted and rolled back. Then we could look up through the open space in Orion. Whence came the voice of God? The holy city will come down through that open space. What are the odds? Come on. And now check this out. Do you see where the nebula is? Where the laver is, the nebula, the Orion Nebula. Do you, does anyone know what a nebula is? A nebula is a place where stars are born. Amen. What? <laughs> so, what does this all show us? <clears throat> that the path to salvation is found in the blueprint. When you are lost, you are somewhere down at the bottom of that map. You're in the black part. Right? And and when you want to be saved, the first thing you must do is get to who? Is get to the sacrifice of Christ. Get to Jesus. Amen? Amen. That's the first thing we must do. Get to Jesus. Imagine with me, if you will, that there are ten demons standing in between the altar of sacrifice and you. They don't want you to be saved. So there's a line of 10 demons. But by the grace of God, you break through that line of 10 demons and you get to the cross. And you know what happens? We can now say, praise God. I made it. I'm safe. There's nothing left to worry about. The plan of salvation is finished. No? How can we know? No. Because what we've just done is cut out 90% of the rest of the plan of salvation. The genuine Christian who who accepts Christ in his heart will be baptized. So imagine 20 demons standing in between. If there were 10 here, there are 20 right here. If you are baptized or if you accept Christ and get baptized and you're truly genuine, the genuine Christian is gonna be found doing what? Studying the word, praying and letting his light shine. So, so, if there were 20 demons here, there are 60 demons right there. (laughs) You're too busy to study. Now, guess what? And this is what I love, beloved. You know what? Blueprint, blueprints don't lie. (laughs) You see, where is God ultimately trying to get us? Do you see that? Do you see as you're leading your friends and showing them, oh, yeah, yeah, we should accept Christ. Yeah, that's right. Of course we should be baptized. And yes, we should study the Lord. And you can just get excited right along with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, come on, come on. Because guess where it's all leading? (laughs) We must accept Christ. We must be baptized. We must be found studying the word of God. We must be found praying. We must let our light shine. And we must keep his commandments. 
There is no other way around it. There is no shortcut. God gives Israel this blueprint. You cannot understand why the devil hates it, amen? He doesn't want the world to understand this. God gives Israel this blueprint like a football, like a whatever you want. Football, he says to them, take it down the field. You're with me so far in the movie. And off Israel goes. They're taking this ball, but what begins to happen is Israel begins to fumble the ball. They begin to like really mess up because the devil's trying to stop them from getting this blueprint out into all the world. And they're trying to advance. And what happens, they begin to fall into idolatry and apostasy so much so that God puts them in time out. Go sit on the sideline. He sends them into what? Captivity. How long do they spend in captivity? 70 years. It is during this 70 year period that a prophet by the name of Daniel comes upon the scene and Daniel is given a series of prophecies. The first of which is called the 70 week prophecy. The what everyone? Okay, now, so far, are you with me in your movie? Just let me see your hands if you're with me in the movie, okay? Now, at this 70-week prophecy, some of us have said, I've read it and it's really difficult to understand. Let me juice it for you, okay? The 70-week prophecy found in the book of Daniel chapter 9 is very simple. It's simply stated to Israel. Israel, you have 70 weeks. Now, how many days in a week? Seven. Seven. And in Bible prophecy, a day equals a? year meaning the 70 weeks is actually uh the the uh the 70 weeks is actually 490 days but more so or prophetically speaking 490 years so israel you have 490 years to get it together the messiah will be coming within that time period and if you're not ready to receive him then i'm going to take the blueprint from you and i'm going to give it to somebody else are you with me There goes your 70-week prophecy. Well, guess what happens? This 70-week prophecy, which began, according to the angel, in the year 457 BC, ranged from the Medo-Persian Empire. You count 490 years, it brings you down to the time of the Roman Empire. Guess who came in the time of the Roman Empire? Jesus. And how did the Jews accept, how did the Jews receive Jesus? They rejected him. In rejecting him, let me show you what they ended up doing. They rejected the Lamb of God. They rejected the water of life. They rejected the bread of life. They rejected his prayer for forgiveness. They comprehended not the light and they rejected his law. In other words, the very blueprint that was to direct Israel to the Messiah, they rejected the Messiah and the blueprint that he gave them. And so what did God do? He took the blueprint from them. Watch what happens at the cross. There is a transition in the Old Testament, literal Israel, earthly temple. After the cross, spiritual Israel, heavenly temple. Are you with me? Vertical, literal, after the cross, horizontal, spiritual. The blueprint is now given to New Testament church, spiritual Israel. And guess what? Off they go down the field. What is their message? Christ has risen and is now in the heavenly what? Sanctuary. So off they go down the field and the devil is trying to stop what they're doing. And and he tries to persecute them, but the more they're persecuted, guess what? The more they multiply. So the devil has to come up with a new tactic, which introduces us to the second time prophecy found in the book of Daniel. It is known as the 1260 year prophecy. Now let me explain something very quickly. There is really only one time prophecy in the book of Daniel. How many? One. These other prophecies are simply subsections of that one prophecy. Are you with me? So, the longest prophecy in the book of Daniel is the 2300 days or year prophecy. 
if the, four, the 70 weeks is the first part of that prophecy. That's a transition from literal and earthly to spiritual and heavenly, okay? So now the devil's like, oh no, what am I going to do now? Spiritual Israel, sanctuary where? In heaven. So guess what the next time prophecy, the 1260 years is about? It's about Satan's attack on spiritual Israel and heavenly temple. Are you with me? How does he do it? According to the book of Daniel, a couple of things were to happen. Number one, the daily sacrifice was to be taken away. Where would you point to on our altar, on our, uh, in our blueprint? Daily sacrifice taken away. Number one, very good. What was also to happen? The, it was to cast down the truth to the ground, according to Daniel 8, verse 12. So where would we find the truth? Okay, the law of God. Excellent. What else was to happen? He would wear out the saints of the Most High. Where would you point to? The seven branch candles. You are the light of the world. He would wear out the saints of the Most High. Uh, he would also, according to 2 Thessalonians 3, 4, show himself that he is God. Where would you point to? Six. Number six. Very good. And he would also think to change times and Laws, where would you point to? Article number six. Very good. And this is exactly what we find happening during the 1260 year period known as the Dark Ages. How? Watch. The papal church cast down the truths of the sanctuary by replacing them with counterfeits. Number one, instead of the one-time sacrifice of Christ being sufficient, the church replaced it with the teaching of penance and indulgences. You have to pay if you want your sins forgiven. And Christ's death, by the way, his one-time death isn't good enough. Every time we break the bread, he dies again. Number two, the truth of baptism was replaced with infant sprinkling. You don't need to confess and be baptized. We'll just sprinkle you as a child. Number three, the word of God was cast down and replaced by church traditions. And by the way, you can interpret the Bible. Only the scholars can. Number four. Christ's mediation, as represented by the altar of incense, was cast down and in its place was put a confessional booth. Now, you know what a confessional booth looks like? It's a two-compartment room divided by a curtain. I'm going to wait. <laughs> it's a two-compartment room divided by a curtain with a man sitting in the place of God hearing the confessions of other men. There goes your confessional booth. <clears throat> the light of the church was attacked in the fact that the papal system sought to put out the light of God's middle Age church. In other words, that's why it's called the Dark Ages. Because the church persecuted anyone that didn't believe as she believed. And then we know that that same church went up into the most holy place and took the law of God, took the Sabbath commandment out and replaced it with the first day of the week. Check this out. There is the Pope sitting between two covering cherubs seated as it were in the place of God do you see how this is up do you, you think it's coincidence now in our movie it looks like what's going to happen it looks like evil is winning and good is losing but wait there's one more prophecy <laughs> Daniel 8, 14. 
It says in Daniel 8, verse 13 and 14, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? In other words, the angel is asking, How long is this little horn going to be able to do its work of deception? And the answer comes back, Unto 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, let's go through this again. Remember, the prophecy began in what year? 457 BC. You count 490 years, which is the first section of this prophecy. It brings you to the, to the time of who? Christ, right? Down to the year 34 AD. That's exactly 490 years. The remaining amount of years is 1810 years. If you count 1810 years, it brings you down to the year 1844. And what would happen in 1844 is mind blowing. But let's check this out. How would the truths that had been cast down during the dark ages be restored by 1844? Listen, I want to see if I can get through this as quickly as I can. Over a period of 500 years, God began to raise up different movements that restored different aspects of the truths that were cast down. Oh my. Beginning with the 1300s, a man by the name of John Wycliffe comes upon the scene. John Wycliffe is the, it, uh, translates the Bible into the language of the common people and thus is known as the morning star of the Reformation. Wycliffe effectively restores the table of showbread. Now, how many of you, if you were living in the time of Wycliffe, would have said, man, if Wycliffe, if I was living in his time, I would have been following Wycliffe. But you know that you would have been treated like a cult. Please keep that in mind. <clears throat> in the 1400s, Martin Luther is born. Martin Luther begins the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s. Martin Luther is the founder of what movement? The Lutheran movement. And let me just say right here, praise God for the Lutheran movement. God brought it upon the scene for such a time as that because Martin Luther, as he's, as he's reading the Bible, he discovers the truth of justification by faith, that the one-time sacrifice of Christ is sufficient for the forgiveness of sins, and he effectively restores the truth being taught at the altar of sacrifice. Now, how many of you would have said, man, if I was in Luther's day, man, I would have been right there with Luther, except that if you were doing that, you would have been treated as a cult. <laughs> 1500s, another man by the name of John Calvin, the founder of the Presbyterian movement. John Calvin, let me throw the name John Knox in there as well. Both these men came to the conclusion that prayer was something, in fact, of Calvin. It is said that no one has written more on prayer than John Calvin. Calvin had a strong burden that, that you didn't have to go through priests and popes for God to hear you. You could have direct access to God yourself, restoring, effectively restoring the altar of incense. Now check this out. Guess who was persecuting the Presbyterians? The Lutherans. In the 1600s, John Smith and Roger William are founders of the Baptist movement. They rediscover the truth that baptism is not by sprinkling, but by immersion, effectively restoring the labor. How many of you said, man, if I was in that, those days, I would have been a Baptist. <laughs> Only problem is, you would have been treated like a cult. And guess who was persecuting the Baptists? The Presbyterians and the Methodists, they found something in common. Like, hey, man, let's get together and get those Baptists. <laughs> Do you see what's happening? Listen, I can imagine in the time of the 1600s that people may have been like, why are you Baptists so focused upon baptism? It's because that's the truth that God had given them to focus upon. It was present truth for that time. In the 1700s, John Wesley forms the Methodist movement. 
And the Methodist move, John Wesley, is very strong on the lay evangelists. We are all witnesses for Christ. Go out there and do the work of evangelism. And they preached and preached everywhere they could. And guess what? If you were living in the 1700s, I'm sure you'd probably say, man, I would have been a Methodist. Except that the Methodists were treated like a cult. And guess who persecuted them? (laughs) Everybody that came before them. (laughs) Well, we have one article of furniture left to be restored. (laughs) I'm just saying. (laughs) I'm just saying. What are the odds? What are the odds? Please listen carefully. What are the odds? What are, man. What are the odds? That, that God would bring a movement in the 1800s that would restore the final truth left to be restored. What are the odds that the Seventh-day Adventist movement came upon the scene by accident? Beloved, can I share something with you? You have a prophetic birth certificate. You know what I love about the Adventist church? Listen, it was formulated from people from all the other denominations. <laughs> all of them, the Baptists, the Presbyterian, the Calvin, all of them, they came out. And, and because they were willing to advance with truth wherever truth went, beloved, this is the final movement. There is no other movement after this. You are it. I hope you understand the gravity of what you're seeing here. You are not a Seventh-day Adventist by mistake or by accident. God has called you upon the scene for such a time as this. How many of you have ever heard of the play? Let me tell you about it. University of California Golden Bears and the Stanford University Cardinals on Saturday, that is a Sabbath, November 20th, 1982. Stanford had taken a 20 to 19 point lead with four seconds left on the clock. Please understand this. All Stanford has to do is kick the ball off. There are four seconds left on the clock. Are you with me? I don't know if you're with me. (laughs) There are four seconds left on the clock. All they got to do is kick the ball off and, and stop Cal State from returning and the game is over. And so the Stanford band is, is they're, they're, you know, they're beginning, to, they're taking their place and now they're now about to play because they know that the game is over. And Stanford kicks the ball off, and the clock begins to count down. Three, two, one, zero. There is now no time left on the clock. The play is still going. So Cal State gets the ball, and off they go. The first guy gets the ball. He's running down the field, and Stanford, they're playing. They're already marching on the field. (laughs) The first guy gets the ball, he's running, and he gets tackled. But before he hits the ground, he laterals the ball to his teammate. The commentator speaking, you hear his voice. You know, it starts with a low, you know how the commentator do, right? Low voice, hey, he gets the ball, he's running. When he gets tackled but tosses the ball, laterals the ball, the second teammate catches it, and off he goes down the field, and he gets tackled. But before he hits the ground, he laterals the ball. And you hear the commentator's voice rising. And I can imagine the, the, the Stanford band, as they're playing, they're probably like, <laughs> okay. The third guy gets tackled, but before he hits the ground, he laterals the ball, and a fourth person catches it. And now the commentator, you can hear him, he's actually standing on his feet, and his voice is elevated. That fourth guy gets tackled, but before he hits the ground, he laterals the ball to the fifth guy. And the fifth guy, he's about to get tackled. tackled. He laterals the ball again to one of his teammates. And the sixth guy takes the ball. He runs over a band player into the end zone. It is pandemonium. They win the game. Listen to me. The devil thinks the game is over. Why? Because there's no prophetic time left on the clock. In my imagination, I see the angels, all the angels of the universe on there. You know, they're... (laughs) 
because they're watching. There's no more prophetic time, and they know that this is it. And beloved, all I'm saying is that although the devil and his band are marching now, I'm just saying the game is not over. God's people, you are it. We are being called to take the ball into the end time. Beloved, you are not, you have not been brought upon earth at this time in earth's history. You have not, you are not here by accident. You are here for such a time as this. Watch this. Look at the pattern. At the the altar of sacrifice, we have the birth and death of Christ. At the labor, we have baptism of Christ. At the altar of, uh, at the, in the most holy place, we have Christ spending 40 days of conflict in the wilderness over the word, over intercession, and over worship. You remember that when he went into the wilderness? Watch this. We have Christ emerging out of the wilderness to preach the everlasting gospel, which is the law of God combined with the mercy of God. Listen, look at, the, look at the pattern. You have the New Testament church birthed by the cross. You have Pentecost at the labor. You have the New Testament church entering into the wilderness for 1260 years in a conflict over the word, intercession, and worship. You have that same church emerging out of the wilderness after 1844 to preach the three angels' messages which points to the law of God. In the very life of Christ is a pattern being followed by the church through its prophetic history. The Bible says in Daniel 7, verse 9 and 10, I beheld till thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did did sit. His throne was like the fiery flame, his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were open. Let me make this very simple, beloved. Listen, when the judgment begins and what year did it begin in? 1844, the books were opened, not for our benefit, but for the benefit of angels in heaven. Why would angels in heaven need books? Very simple. Angels can't read the human heart. Only God can. So when God says, for example, uh, uh, you know, think of some guy that, that, that was on crack cocaine and living his life horribly. And at the end of his life, in his mind, without anyone hearing, he says, Father, forgive me. And God says, I forgive you. You are saved. And then he turns around to the angel and says, write that man's name in the book of life. And the angels are going. <laughs> um, God, did you see? Okay, okay. I believe you. God says, don't worry, because one day I will open the books to show why I am bringing these people into the society of heaven. I'm going to show you that they are safe to bring into heaven. So at the end of this judgment, God says, or these angels will say, basically, just and true are thy ways, O God. Yes, all these people are safe. You know, your judgment is right. All these people are safe to enter heaven. Remember that. Remember that. The preaching of the three angels' messages is what begins in 1844. Beloved, we are, we are wrapping up our movie. We have gone through from the, from the beginning of time. We are now down to our time. Are you with me? Are you okay? All right. So listen, follow me closely here. I want to try to finish this as quickly as I can. The first angel's message says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting what? Gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his what? Judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of water. What does it mean to fear God? Very simple. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and do what? Keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. The first angel's message calls us to worship God by keeping his commandments. 
The second angel's message, by the way, the first angel's message is really very simple. Get into the ark. It is the same message that Noah preached. You, 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 you didn't. Yeah. The first angel's message is very simple. Get into the ark. What ark? The ark of the covenant. Second angel's message, very simple. There followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. What is the wine of the wrath of her fornication? What is the purpose of it? The book of Proverbs tells us. It says, Give not thy strength unto women, that is the daughters of Babylon, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. Why? Because we are those kings that God is redeeming. Amen? Amen. Why? It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Why shouldn't we drink? Why shouldn't we drink the wine of Babylon? Because the wine of Babylon is designed to make us forget what God said to remember. And what what did God say to remember? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That's the second angel's message. The third angel's message, it says, the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark. By the way, beloved, when you're doing a movie and it's like the action scene, you have to speak really fast. That's why I'm doing this, okay? So what's the action scene right now? If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. And here's how it ends. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Very simple. The mark of the beast must be opposite of keeping the commandments of God. Those who keep the commandments of God will not receive the Mark of the beast. So the mark of the beast then must be a counterfeit law. Listen to this. Get ready. Exodus 24 verse 10 through 12. Then I looked and behold, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims, there appeared over them as it were a sapphire stone. Read, say that with me everyone. A sapphire stone as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. So the throne has this Sapphire appearance. What color sapphire? Blue. (laughs) As they saw, and they saw the God of Israel, that there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire. So underneath his feet was also a paved work of sapphire stone or blue. And as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. Now watch this. And the Lord said unto Moses, come up unto me into the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone. I will give thee tables of stone. Uh, and a law and commandments which I have written that thou mayest teach them. So God was going to give Moses tables of stone. What stone? Sapphire stone. God's blue print. You know what blue represents in the Bible? Notice what it says. Numbers 15, 39, speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue and it shall be unto you for a fringe that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments second angel's message don't drink wine because it'll cause you to forget third angel's message keep the commandments don't receive the mark the mark must be a counterfeit a counterfeit of god's blueprint now what would be a counterfeit of god's blueprint or his blue law I'm just saying. I looked it up. Why do they call it a blue law? No one knows why. We know why. 
We know why. Because it's a counterfeit. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. And after that I looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple having the seven last plagues. So now you understand, this is a, we are wrapping things up here. And, and, and the three angels' messages have been preached. And now John sees angels, seven angels coming out with the seven last plagues. Where are they coming out of? The temple of the tabernacle of the testimony, which is is the most holy place. Think about this. The angels of the seven last plagues are seen coming out of the most holy place with plagues. Why? Could it be because those who receive the plagues are those who rejected what was found in the most holy place? The law of God. That's why we need to get into the ark of safety. Psalm 91 tells us that very clearly. He that dwelleth in the secret place. Stop. Where is the secret place? It's the most holy place. Check this out. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings covering cherubs. Under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and thy buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the hour that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, Neither shall any get into the ark. (laughs) Jesus comes and the righteous are resurrected. Amen? Amen. The Bible tells us for the dead in Christ shall rise first. Those who died with Christ, altar of sacrifice, are going to do what? They're going to rise first. Let me move on. It's interesting that after we rise, what's going to happen? We're going to be transformed, aren't we? We're going to be purified, just like the labor teaches. Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. In other words, beloved, your spirit doesn't enter into heaven first. You must be totally purified to enter into the kingdom of God. Think about that. <laughs> State of the dead, oh, your spirit goes, no, 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 no. Except you are purified all over, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. As we, as we are purified, we're going to enter into that city represented by the seven branch candlestick. According to Revelation 22 verse 14, and when we enter that city, we're going to sit at the welcome, you know the song. And what's going to happen after we sit at that welcome table and we rejoice with Christ? We're going to spend a thousand years, aren't we? We're going to spend a thousand years doing what? Reviewing the record of Christ's intercession. His rejected intercession for the wicked. Revelation 20 talks about seeing an angel coming down from heaven and he lays hold on the dragon and he is bound for 1,000 years and then it says that the righteous were set upon thrones and what was given unto them? Judgment was given unto them. It is time for jury duty. Are you with me? Now watch, beloved, in that jury duty, in that jury duty, we are going to judge why the wicked did not make it to heaven. And in this judgment called the millennial judgment, at the end of it, we too will say with the angels that came before us, remember when they said, just and true are thy ways, O God? Yes, we see that everyone you bring into heaven is, does have a right to be there. At the end of the millennial judgment, the righteous will join the righteous angels and saying, just and true are thy ways, O God. Everyone that is lost deserves to be lost. And everyone that is saved deserved or was, was saved because of your righteousness. 
So watch what's happening. Righteous humanity agrees with the angels. At the end of that millennium, the wicked dead are resurrected. You all know this story, right? So I'm not going to even read these verses. We're just going to, the wicked dead are resurrected. And beloved, at this time, planet Earth becomes the largest movie theater the world has ever seen. Why? Because God will open the books one more time. And before the wicked, they will see in panoramic view all that they had done in rejecting the Messiah. Now, here's what I'm saying. The reason why I entitled this sermon Earth's Final Movie, this is Earth's Final Movie. I don't want the wicked looking up at me, looking at me in the city and saying, you saw this movie and didn't tell me about it? You told me about all these other movies. You saw this movie and you didn't tell me about it? (coughs) Beloved, (coughs) this movie is no make-believe. It is reality TV. And God has called you to be a star in this movie. They that turn many to what? Righteousness shall shine as the stars. I want to be a star in this movie. How about you? And so, at the end of this movie, when the wicked must now be destroyed, check this out. Before, when the wicked look at their record and they see that they have justly been condemned, you know what they're going to say? They're going to say, just and true are that. Do you see what just happened? Not only do the righteous angels in the pre-advent judgment of 1844 end their judgment by saying just and true. Not only do the righteous who are resurrected with Christ and and who are translated to to meet Christ in the year when they go through their judgment. They also join the angels saying just and true are thy ways, O God. The wicked themselves. In other words, the entire universe will agree with God's decision to destroy the devil, his angels, and the wicked, including the devil, his angels, and the wicked themselves. There will never come a time in heaven where we will say, I wonder if God really made the right decision in destroying. No. We will remember that even the wicked themselves said, yes, I deserve this. By the way, If you don't, if you're not on God's side now, you can't be a juror. There will be no devil's advocate in this 1,000-year millennium. (laughs) Aren't you guys being a little bit too hard on the devil? Wait a minute, I object. It's not going to happen. And so, God, the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 20, verse 13 and 14, that the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to, to their works. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the what? Second death. Do you remember how the Bible said in Ezekiel 28, verse 14, that Satan would be destroyed from the stones of fire? I want to suggest to you, could it be that those stones of fire are none other than the law of God? Do you remember when God wrote the law? The Bible says in Deuteronomy 33 that a fiery law came from his hand. Could it be that Lucifer will be destroyed in the midst of the very law that he first broke? And so will the wicked. And so now comes the time for the destruction. And according to Hebrews 12 verse 29, the Bible says our God is a consuming fire. Please get this very carefully. The reason why our God is a consuming fire is because God is a God of love. A God of what, everyone? Love. Meaning that God desires for us to be able to stand in his presence and not be consumed. You remember Daniel? Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? thrown into a fiery furnace but because God was in the mix with them the fire didn't touch them now how many of you want to be able to stand in the presence of God well you better be fireproof (laughs) if you're not fireproof you're going to burn up the reason why God will not allow the wicked into heaven is because they would be tortured forever God loves the wicked too much to allow them into heaven because it would be eternal torture for them. Can you imagine God coming to you and saying, I want to hug you? 
can you, can you give me a hug? Can I talk to you for a minute? And you're like, ah! You're running from fire. The angels are fire. The sea of glass mingled with fire. How many of you want to stand on that sea of glass mingled with fire? Yep, you better be fire proof. That's why the Bible says that we're to be baptized not only with water, but with fire. So that when we become fire creatures, you know what I'm saying? Like heartburn. When we become fire creatures and when God comes, we're not running from him. My son, when he was about four, five, six years old, anytime we were wearing anything alike, jeans, jeans, blue shirt, blue shirt, he'd be like, oh, dad, jeans, jeans, blue shirt, blue shirt. It just thrilled his soul to no end. Beloved, guess what? When Jesus comes in fire, because we have been baptized with the fire of the Holy Spirit, when we see him, Fire, fire. The wicked, because they're not fireproof, will be burnt up. Ashes. The Bible tells in Ezekiel 28 that Satan himself will become as ashes. I say amen to that. Sin will be destroyed. Revelation 22 tells us there was a new heaven and a new earth. Amen. Amen. And Isaiah 66 tells us that as the new heavens and the new earth, which I shall create, so every Sabbath, from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh will come before me and worship. Why? Just because, just like as in ancient Israel, the Sabbath was kept as a reminder of Israel's deliverance from captivity. So throughout all eternity, every Sabbath, we are going to celebrate the deliverance God brought to us from this crooked and corrupted world. And then it shall be happily ever after. I have an appeal for you. How many of you know about the Underground Railroad? The Underground Railroad. The Underground Railroad was a system set up during the time of slavery where people who understood how to get out of captivity into freedom, they would go from station to station station to station, leading slaves step by step into freedom. Guess what God is looking for right now? He's looking for conductors. He's looking for people who will be able to lead those who are looking for freedom from sin and freedom from confusion to lead them step by step, altar of sacrifice, labor, table of showbread, altar of incense, seven branch candlestick, law of God, freedom from Babylon. God is calling each one of us to be a conductor. Here is my appeal. This message has convicted you and you're saying today, Lord, make me a conductor. I want to learn this message so that I can teach it and preach it. Lord, please, here I am. Use me. I want to ask you to stand to your feet. Not all of you, only those of you who are convicted, please. Only those of you who are saying, Lord, Please, I want to master this message. I want to lead people out of the slavery of bondage, the bondage of slavery, and into the freedom of Jesus. Heavenly Father, make us to shine as the stars. Make us to turn many to righteousness. Please, dear Lord, forgive us for the role we have played. Forgive us for not realizing you have called us to serve in the supreme court of heaven. Lord, put this message into our hearts and into our minds. Lord, that we might know it like the back of our hands. And Lord, may we take your blueprint, your law, into all the world that the world might catch a glimpse of your love for us and your extravagant and ultimate plan to lead every man out of captivity into freedom is our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. Amen.